All right. So, um, you know, thank you for doing this. First of all, I, this is, this is awesome. Um, uh, the, the whole idea behind this to, you know, ask you came from DeMarco's tweet the other day that somebody put out there, um, you know, who's really good to talk about the foot and the ankle complex and DeMarco pretty much instantly responded you and your staff. Um, so before we dive into that, um, that'll be the first question, but why don't you just kind of give any of the, the listeners out there just kind of a brief uh, rundown of where you've been and where you're at now. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. I uh, appreciate you guys. Anytime I get to talk training, get to talk leadership culture, you know, I'm fired up about that. Uh, so I'm Jeff Jones. I'm the director of athletic performance at Arkansas State. I've been here, we're going on year two now. Uh, I've been coaching for 15 years. I went to Central College in Iowa, played small college football there, uh, found a passion for athletic performance and absolute love for it. And through there, went through, you know, internships, GAs, spent a lot of time at Boise State when I was really young in my career, very fortunate for that. Met a lot of really good mentors, a lot of really good coaches, was surrounded by some excellent athletes. Uh, after Boise State, I actually went to Arkansas State with Ryan Russell, was here for a short six months. Then we went to Auburn. I was at Auburn for three years. Uh, after three years there, my wife and I were from Northern Iowa. We went to a Division three school there, uh, Luther College, and I became the director. We wanted to close, get closer to home, start a family. And then uh, after Luther, three years, went to App State. And that was my first time being a director uh, in FBS, right, for Division One football team at Appalachian State. One year at App, spent a year in Iowa at a high school, Fairfield, Iowa, and then uh, got a call. And, you know, I was fortunate to get back in and uh, be a director again, you know, because I learned a lot at App State, spent one good year there. But uh, I, I wanted to be back at Division One. Uh, directing and leading, and and I'm very fortunate to be back in it. Actually, now that you talk about the that one year at App State, I feel like there was a period of time too where everybody was very pro what you guys were doing there because there was no back squat, there was no hang power clean or regular like cleaning from the floor um, or power clean like you were. You were using, um, you know, the pit sharks and you guys were doing your, your box, box squats that way and, and peak power production that way. And, um, you know, Twitter verse kind of went out of the world because you guys did win, you know, a championship. Like every, it was like, hey, look, high level football can be done without doing some of these tried and true principles. So you're, uh, you're kind of rocking the boat on, uh, on well, Twitter and the social media world. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that, you know. Um, I take, a, I take a lot of pride in intentional training and, and developing athletes, right? I take a lot of pride in learning and growing. And just because something was done uh, the way it was in the 80s and 90s, and just because I was taught that at a young age, at ages 20, 21, 22, do we still have to do it that way? You know, uh, Mike Boyle has been a big influence on me in that regards. So, you know, I, I, I've... I've thought differently, right? And I believe, you know, I'm, I call it, I'm on this constant quest, this holy grail of programming. I want to find the best way to develop athletes at the highest level. And, you know, I'm always reading, I'm always learning, uh, experimenting, right? That's a big part of it, doing that. And the, the cool thing is, is the way we trained at App State, now at Arkansas State, you know, that was my first year there, right? And if you would look at how we trained, how we coached, and now we're at year two at Arkansas State, a lot of those same principles are the same, but I believe the training, the quality of training, the level of detail, the development we've had is even better. And obviously that was just one year at App State, you know? So it's been fun to, to especially now me being year two and just to see some of the development from year one here to now year two. So you're telling me that you didn't just copy, paste, change logos mm -hmm. and just you know, run the same exact system, regardless of the fact you have different facilities and different athletes. Yeah, no, we didn't. You know, I'm a big <laughs> believer in things though. So one of the first purchases we made were six belt squats. So we have six rogue rhino belt squats. Absolutely love those. We have, you know, and another purchase was 12 safety squat bars. Cause I'm a big believer in, in heavy split squats and hand support split squats. So we got 12 of those. Uh, we just got newer trap bars too. I'm a big believer and you got to lift heavy. Uh, very, you, you want to lift bilaterally. You want to do it heavy. You just want to do it in a, uh, in a way that has a lower orthopedic cost. 
and that's what we've done you know and i bought timers right away like timers is big deal to us we have a 1080 sprint machine that we use twice a week every player in a program they get two reps a week one on monday one on thursday we record rank and publish those 1080 sprint reps and we compete with it the same with our timer stuff so it's it's similar but to me it's a it's a refined and it's it's uh it's better now than it was obviously in 2019 and that was just my first year as a director as well you know, when you guys are running through all those, are you doing it in a circuit style where you have, uh, you know, the Brower type, like, are you using Brower timer in addition to having the 1080 right there and like a contrast style or how you guys are using it? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Mondays and Thursdays are our speed acceleration days. Mondays is more of a heavier acceleration day. Thursday is more of a max V day for us. We do what we call the world's greatest warm up, and we blend in different power speed drills, backwards reach run put a little RPR in there and that's roughly about a 16 to 18 minute warm up. After that warm up, we break our guys up. We do three step acceleration runs too and get them ready to sprint. Just no true speed reps are in that warm up. After that warm up, we have three stations. And on our acceleration day, the three stations are a 1080 station. So our 1080 station on Mondays is going to be more of a gear 2 heavy resisted sprint drill and we'll usually pair stuff because they only get one 1080 rep so we'll pair it with whether it's an unloaded sprint a free sprint another lighter resistance sprint whatever it is we'll pair it with something with a 1080 and then uh, we set personal records for the guys we get prs for the guys and we make every rep meaningful important on that 1080 and then what we do is record rank and publish it uh, who puts out the most power in watts who's you know wh whatever that metric is for that day we put it on the tvs we make a big deal about it and then even from group to group to the guys compete with that and they want to know what, what it would be one station. Our second things where we're working breaks, jumps, plyos, right? So we do, we started off with extensive jumps. That was just a focus, the first phase. And then we progressed to repeat hurdles band resistor bras, different broad jumps there in that station. So that was just more of a jump break spring station. And then our third station was a time to metric. So that was either we brought out the Browers, we did a fly 10 with a five. We did a uh, handheld 20, 20 pound chain resistor sprints where any guys are getting anywhere from three to four reps. But what we did on that time rep station is we got guys to compete. We let them know their times. We made every rep a big deal. And, you know, the, the compound effect of that, right, over eight weeks, over an off season has been really fun just to see the development. And when you look at our speed work, it's not a lot of reps. It's, it's not a lot of volume at all. But we take pride on high quality reps. Uh, that's awesome. And, um, yeah, like the, the, the idea of the record rate published, right, like just how powerful something, you know, yes, having a great tool like the 1080 and the and the you know the Brower timing gates to get the information but then like just the fact that you can send that out and then it can drive intent because guys will you know want to compete with one another and then you get even better intent the next week so um for sure yeah. <clears throat> so let's dive into um you know the foot and ankle complex and um I guess I'll just kind of leave it open-ended. What are some of the things that you guys are doing and um you know what what is something that you know, you would feel like, hey, we, we do pretty darn good considering the fact of, you know, DeMarco speaking so highly of you guys. All right. So I, what I would say is by no means am I a foot and ankle expert, right? I, I haven't studied the foot at, at great detail, right? I know there's 26 bones in each foot, right? And, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on down there. But the biggest thing, I like to simplify things, right? I'm, I'm a pretty simple dude. So when I look at the foot, we, we think about how much time we invest in strength, power, and speed in training the big muscles, training our nervous system. And if we don't give any love to the foot, think about all the forces that go through the foot and through the lower leg when you're sprinting, when you're jumping, when you're competing, just even walking, right, throughout every day. And if you don't train the foot directly, I really think you're missing out on, number one, some resilience in the foot and ankle and the lower leg. And then number two, I think you're missing out on, some strength, power, and speed gains. And, and uh, what we do well is it's basics, right? Everything I've done for the foot, I haven't thought of. I've stolen it from other people. So 
a couple things we do is every warm up, uh, and you know, we're talking about John Waters, right? He probably is bored. Uh, just he every day he coaches tib raises and a version of knee over toe calf raises or calf raises every day in the warm up. He's he's a tib raise expert on how to coach it. So if you ever want to know about that, ask Coach Waters. Uh, so we 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 want to get our guys really good at tib raises, right? And that's just butt on the wall, feet out a little bit, hands on your knees. Pull your toes up as high as you can. Work the range of motion. Work uh, every inch. Pause at the bottom. You know, just keep your feet together. And uh, we do that all the time. Every single warm-up in the weight room. So that is one aspect of training the lower leg and the foot. Another aspect we do is Lee Taft. I don't know if you've ever seen his stability hops, but, man, was it probably four years ago I had this game-like speed DVD from him. And he was really big into stability hops. And I started implementing them, and I absolutely love them. And basically what a stability hop is, it's not a single leg hurdle jump. It's not that. It is a, a lower level jump, but you are slamming your foot down with a lot of force at a, with a good shin angle, basically the exact same angles that you're going to make a cut on the field or on the court. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. And we use, we use speed ladders. So we wanted to get our guys really good at stability hops, forward stability hops, where they're slamming the foot down, making a, a, a lot of, putting a lot of force in the ground, knee over toe, right? The knee obviously can't track in. They're sticking and stabilizing for three long seconds for, for each rep. And uh, we do it lateral. We do it inside leg lateral. We do, uh, we want to be really good at that. So we do that all the time. And we, in fact, we've done it for a whole year here but we retaught it yesterday and we just emphasized it a little bit more and it, it, guys kind of cleaned it up a little bit, but we're always going to be doing stability hops. We'll never graduate away from that. So you got your tip raises, you got your stability hops. We do a, a lot of lower level single leg hopping, whether it's like side to side line drills, whether it's those, uh, you know, the jump, the vector, right? The eight vector. We got these hex rings, agility rings, and we'll just have guys do single leg work and hitting all different uh, vectors on that hex just, you know, for lower leg foot resilience. And we do a ton of speed ladder work that is single leg. And, you know, I think a lot of people would say you're doing quick foot drills on the speed ladder. Well, we're doing single leg foot and ankle stability work on the speed ladder where they're on the ball of the foot. Right. And they're learning to control their foot. They're learning to control their lower leg. And then also, you know, talk about stealing from other people is Altus. We do, we love our rudimentary jumps, right? You know, whether it's double leg rudimentary jumps, single leg rudimentary jumps, forward, backwards, lateral, we'll do those through the ladder too. And uh, just trying to build a stable foot, a stronger foot. You know, we love unilateral training, right? Single leg training. We'll do uh, single leg RDLs and bare feet. We'll do, you know, uh, single leg unsupported work. And then I really got into at, uh, when I was at Luther College is slant boards, right? Where it's more isolating it. And uh, we just haven't got good slant boards here. So we haven't done a ton of isolation. I would say we have done more integration where it's more, you know, uh, movement based uh, stability work where it's through the ladders, through the stability hops and that stuff. But that doesn't mean that I don't love the slant board stuff because I do. It's just that's something we haven't got to here. So is that are you talking like slant boards in terms of in the warm up pre training or slant boards for elevating the heel when doing any of your bilateral lifts? Oh, so I would say not not during the bilateral lifts, as in yeah. barefoot post training, build stability through the foot, and they're the smaller slant boards where there's a little instability on it, and uh, you're just training the foot, ankle, calf, and. I, I love that. It's just something that we haven't done here yet just because we haven't got those slam boards. You talked about that eight vector. Are you, are you truly having the guys go like, you know, a single leg hop forward, immediately come back right for that 180 um, on the right leg and the left leg and then going, you know, forward 45 degrees down and whatnot. Is that how you guys are progressing that drill for um, the foot? Yeah, we haven't progressed there yet. We've basically have done just single leg. Yep. And then it's just hopping. So you're hopping on all those eight points and you return and you retrace it. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. You know, that makes sense. 
So. And when you, you mentioned, you know, barefoot single leg RDL, are you guys having them do all of their auxiliary stuff barefoot or, you know, nope. just, you know, certain movements of that? Okay. Certain movements when I want to go, when we want to go really heavy and uh, you know, we've been, we've had guys do 275 pounds, 245 pounds, 255 on single leg RDLs. When we're going to go really heavy, and we do low reps. We do three reps, four reps, five. Uh, we rarely go above five on single leg RDL. Uh, when we're gonna, when we're just doing dumbbell and we're not really challenging ourselves as far as like heavy load. Sure, if they want to take off their shoes, I'm good at that. But if we're gonna really challenge the load and push ourselves, and we need three of the the most precise reps we can get, we'll we'll have them take off their shoes and concentrate just so you can you know you can feel the as Landau calls, right, the tripod of the foot. And we coach that. We coach that a lot, the tripod of the foot, right, the big toe, the little toe, and the heel. And we get guys to try to squeeze the ground. And, you know, you know a single leg RDL is a little bit easier and, and you could say probably more effective when you're barefoot. Uh, did you have any paradigm shift to try to get the guys to buy into the idea of loading that movement as heavy as you, you know you're talking about? Yeah, you know, uh, no. No. Uh, I've always pro progression is huge, right? Like the one thing I believe in is just because the exercise exists doesn't mean you need to do it. And I've always loved the single leg RDL. You know what I'm saying? I've loved it. And we're going to do it all the time. <laughs> and when you do it all the time, you get pretty damn good at it. And then when you have them sign off, like, so we sign off, we sign off weird stuff, Lima, right? It's not you guys just highlight the lift card, like circle it off. Yeah, so we'll sign off single leg RDL. We'll sign off Nordics. We have a rating system where we'll sign off Nordics and we'll rate them one through five. We'll sign off different, you know, hip ex weighted 45 degree hip extensions, different things like that, or all our jump metrics, all these different things. So when you sign something off, when you overload it over a period amount of time, right? Uh, guys are gonna want to just naturally handle more loads, and it, and it never became. Hey, I want you to get 275 because it's going to look really cool on video. It's just, let's see how much more we can add while still being technically sound. And then it's crazy, you know, guys handling 275, doing it really good for three solid reps. And then a guy sees his buddy do that. Oh crap, man, I, I can go 275. I can do 255. I can do that. So that, that's been that deal there. Yeah. You almost get the same effect of the record ring published, except just, you know, in a, in a quicker feedback loop because the guys are training each other right there. Um, when you yes. talked about the one through five, are you guys progressing, regressing people based off of how they do like, Hey, it's been two weeks. And, you know, I've, I've been signing off on, you know, Lima has been doing that single leg RDL. God, it just looks awful. Like, so we got to go hand supported single leg dumbbell. Like and you guys do it that way too, or. No, we had, we, I have never done a, a hand supported single leg RDL. And I don't Oh no, them. not even just like that. Like truly like, Hey, whatever, like if it was a Nordic or you're like, Hey, we oh. got to regress this. Like this, this kid looks awful or on the vice versa. Like, Hey, you know what? We had this kid at a super young training age and we didn't think he could do X. So we regressed it, but he actually did really good. You know uh, yeah, there are regressions, right? There are regressions. I would say most of our regressions, I think from the outside, people might say we're pretty complex with what we do, but I think on the inside, we know it's, it's, uh, it's about the basics and it's pretty simple. Yeah. So most of the movements, so for example, like Nordic, like let's say a guy, so to me, I, we have a rating system, a one on a Nordic is just a, a, a horse crap Nordic, right? You have no eccentric control, you just fall, right? That's a one. We don't want any ones. Well, the guy that has a one, you're still going to do Nordic, but you know what? Maybe you're going to have your partner hold the back of your shirt and we're going to count for five seconds on the way down. So you got a little bit of eccentric control or we'll put a band around him and we'll focus a little bit more on the eccentric. A two on a rating system is you do show eccentric control, but you lose it and you can't touch your chest. A three is you show eccentric control all the way down chest to the ground, right? That's a three. A four is you're all the way down. And then you come up, but there's there's some posture, there, that there's lack of hip extension. You can go down and up, but it doesn't look really clean. That's a four and a five. We want guys, our skill guys at a five is where you can go all the way down, all the way up, where it's pretty dang good posture. There's not a lot of change. Where that's a rep, you just feel like, yeah, that's a legit Nordic. That's a five, right? A four is like, yeah, that's that's not, that that's close, but that's not 
perfect, right? That's not exactly how we want it to be. And then, so the, the two guy, like, what was have them keep doing Nordics and we'll just focus that last part of the eccentric, whether it's with a band or a partner holding the shirt and doing it that way. So, so he'll still do the Nordic, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, that's, that's really smart. And I like the idea of, you know, that's gotta be kudos to you to be able to communicate that out to all of your, you know, your staff, especially where you're probably going to have staff turnovers because of, you know, people getting hired away from you, but to have to continually communicate, you know, Hey, what's a one through five on uh, multiple metrics, but it kind of helps, it helps you and your staff all be on the same page. Um, but, you know, having that unified vision. So, I mean, to me, that's and, kudos to you on that. And it goes back to what we we're talking about. When we sign off Nordics, when you make something a big deal, you really emphasize it. Yeah. You're going to get more effective results right you're going to get better execution that's what i guess that's what i'm trying to say when you make it a big deal you're signing these off you know we're writing this down you're going to get a little better excuse execution there's going to be a little more um focus to those and, and especially on athletes if we're talking about the incentives if you give them something that you deem important and they naturally can't do it in the first time you know you talk about competitive base in a competitive environment so they'll be like oh it's not just about doing it well, it's about being the best in there, isn't it? So it sort of like self feeds the um, the system and the competition without you sort of having to tinker that much. It's self directed as a tournament, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're right. Yeah, yeah, because they're like, hey, I want to, you know, Fernando's a four. I'm better than Fernando. I, don't, I, I gotta, I gotta perform this threat better. You know what I mean? Like, I am definitely a two. I'm definitely. <laughs> a <one. laughs> um, do you have you experimented or gone down? I'm, Gary Ward is a name that I've, you know, done a little bit of research on in terms of the foot and stuff and like his, his wedges. Um, are there any things that you've, any other people that you, you know, you say you steal information from other really good people. And I mean, I do the exact same thing. I think other good coaches do. Who are some of the people that you, yeah. you know, give the most credit to with that? Um, so the slam board stuff. I, I got into it around six, 2017. Okay. And I haven't, revisit a lot but remember sports science lab mm -hmm. i think they're the ones that kind of i don't know if they're the ones that and i don't know if they invented the slant board but that's kind of where i got the slant board idea that has a little bit of uh instability on it and you just put the ball of foot on there so i, I remember having a dvd from them right when we would get dvds even in 2017 i had a dvd of them and they would do different foot drills on that uh some you know, there, there, there's what you, and this is a, I don't know if Boyle said this, but there's what you know, and then there's what you implement, what you can implement. Well, with the foot stuff, I've seen a lot of different exercises and drills, but what can you implement effectively within a team training environment? And, and, you know, and I always look at that too. That, that totally speaks to something, um, a product that we got here, about six months ago it's called the blackboard um and it's two independent boards that are together so that way you can lock rear foot and forefoot moves or you can lock forefoot and rear foot moves and then you can force uh, or you can unlock both to to truly get a foot to to be able to you know have rear foot forefoot you know moving independently of one another um mm -hmm. and that's something that like you said i just don't have First of all, we don't have many of them because it's a, it's a pretty expensive device, but I don't feel 100% competent enough to implement it in a team training session versus, hey, if I've had a kid who's, you know, one-on-one -on -one with me in a return to play setting, feel a lot more confident with and have like my athletic trainers are starting to use it. Um, some of the other strength coaches on staff, if they have a smaller team with somebody who like, hey, you know, this guy is four foot locked and, you know, it's, it's a great device. But like you said, if I can't implement it in a group of people, it's very not useful. Yeah, I've never heard of that. I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah, it's, the, it's called, it's the blackboard, like it's, I think it's from like my foot function. Um, okay. Aaron Dreggy is one of my, uh, my coworkers and he worked with Chris Corfis um, and Cal Dietz. So like Chris, Chris and Cal's like four foot um, spring ankle series and like, oh. um, I had worked with Mike Chapman before and Mike was really into the foot too. So like that, that device kind of it, it intrigued the two of us. And that's why we were able to look into it. But like you just said, if you, if I know it, but I can't implement it, then it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. On. Uh, 
one of the other things, so you, you started to talk about it, but you know, you went to central Iowa, uh, excuse me, you went to central college in Iowa, you were then working at Luther and then back at, at Fairfield. So in that course, you know, switching gears now talking about family, because that is obviously important into what we're doing as coaches. Um, you went back to kind of reestablish all of that. And now you're back down in Arkansas. So how, how has all of that um, gone and, and, you know, how has that ev evolved for you over time? Yeah. So, uh, you know, when I was done at app, I had some decisions to make. I could be, be uh, in, in, in college at the power five, be an assistant, move all over the world. Uh, I, I didn't want to do that. Right. And, and in fact, I, I was a little bit disgusted how things, uh, I mean, how, how they ended at app. And, and I was just, uh, I wasn't too thrilled with uh, just how things happened in the college environment. Right. Yeah. So I had an opportunity to move close to, well, in the same community that my brother lived. And I'm really close with my brother and my nieces and nephews and his wife, Ange. And, uh, you know, there's an opportunity there. And, and that's exactly what I wanted. And my wife and my little boy, Colt, we moved back there and I had a blast. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I loved, you know, the, the, it wasn't about training there, right? Yeah. You train them, you develop them, you know, you hold them accountable, you get them better, but it's more about being a positive role model, right. And, and teach them how to, to think better and, and mindset and a lot of leadership principles. And, and I, I really uh, focus on that with these athletes, right? It's just very, very different than the college environment. But through that time, you know, I really enjoyed it. I was grateful to have that position. Uh, the quality of life was, was amazing, right? But I was itching to get back in it because I knew I could do it really well at the college level as a director. And I knew the things I needed to work on if I ever got this opportunity again. I, I did a lot of self-reflection and, and I, I knew what, what I needed to do better. And, and I was just hoping, you know, my wife says I was, I was itching uh, by that fall to get back into it. And what I did is I, I did a lot of learning too. I, I was a lot of self-reflection, like I said, a lot of learning, a lot of growing. And, you know, I told myself, if I get this opportunity, I'm going to go attack it. And I was fortunate enough to where I was here before. And this is only seven hours away from where I was living before. Oh, and so yeah, so it wasn't really far away. I've been here before uh, a player I coached in 2012, Ryan Applin. He was a quarterback of the Sun Belt Player of the Year. He he helped me with this position here. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know Coach Butch Jones. Uh, we had re some really good conversations. And it's crazy to me is even during the interview process, I was able to speak on my training system on my culture and my coaching philosophy more than I ever got to in one year at App State to the staff. So that, that was impactful for me, even just through the interview. And, and the best thing Coach Butch Jones has done for me since I got down here is he supported me. And when you have a head coach that supports you, uh, it, it, it makes things, as you know, a lot easier, a lot better and a lot more effective for everyone. Yeah. No, and I mean, that's that's going to be evident by, you know, the fact that, um, yeah, you were at that that high school. But I mean, when you were you, you talk about leadership and you talk about being in Iowa, when I mean, when you were at Luther College, like the things that you set up and the systems that you set up in place there, because that place has continued to succeed with the staff you had in place. I believe that's you were there when I had met you at Iowa. And um, yeah, that was the same time that Ryan Russell came up from Auburn and it was like a, a big melt. Like, I think he brought Connor up. So you had yeah. kept your hand, you know, in the systems of, you know, the high school or the, the, the big power five world, right. You're visiting Iowa while you were working in Iowa, you're still talking to your people from Auburn um, while you're in, you know, a division three world. So I think, um, you know, a coach would be foolish not, not to realize that. Um, and that's probably why you were able to, you know, continue to pull from all of those experiences and see that progression, you know, with a staff and continue to, like you said, self-reflect to, to do the things that you want to do there now. Yeah. Sort of, uh, it's sort of like that saying, you know, that no man crosses the same river twice because he's not the same man and that's not the same river. So it's not even going out 
thinking, well, I need to make sure I get back here at some point. It's just, like you said, self-reflection and being honest with yourself. And, you know, sometimes it's counterintuitive, but actually stepping back or stepping sideways or not in the forward direction is the best way to go forward at some point. Because uh, you find yeah. the space and the distance to actually, you know, even change yourself. Like your priorities change, you get your family, you get that itch again, which we definitely need as coaches, like a coach without an itch. I don't even know what that is. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I had that itch and I had a supportive wife, right. That, that's really important. And she knew, I mean, you know, all, all of our, you know, your wife, they're always going to believe in you. Right. Most of the time. But, you know, she believed in me and uh, this was a, perfect opportunity like i i am so grateful to be here i absolutely love it and there is a true attitude of gratitude every single day and you know uh, I, I, i've been surrounded by great people down here from the football staff to the performance staff that i was able to hire it's been and, and then I, I have a great quality of life like my family from fairfield came down last spring uh just last week and we had four good days with them you know st louis is in the middle my parents come down here and, you know, my wife's parents, you know, so like, I, I, I believe I still have a good blend, right? I, I have a really good quality life because, you know, I love what I'm doing and, you know, I'm, I'm still be, being able to be a dad. And what I've learned too is I'm more of a present dad. I'm more of a present husband than I was year one. And I think that just comes with growth and time, but I'm able just to shut it off and be focused and be a dad at home and be a husband at home and not always think about work and all these things that are going on here. And that's helped me out a bunch. Yeah. Cause that's allowed you, you know, you, you effectively got to play the game of, Hey, what would I tell, what would I tell myself again if I was going to take over because you were, you know, you were out of it. And like you said, you had that itch and they, Hey, if I had to come in somewhere new again, you know, what would I do? And then, you know, lo and behold, it, it did come true for you. Um, yeah. You know, down yeah. there at Arkansas state, what things are you implementing from a leadership standpoint? Because that's been a lot of the conversations that you and I have also had on the phone and via text message. Um, whether it be within your staff, uh, within, you know, Coach Butch Jones's staff, and then um, how that all meshes with, with the players and how leadership is going with that. Yeah, so I would say if we're just talking about Coach Butch Jones first is, you know, every, it seems like every staff meeting is like a leadership workshop. I've learned a ton from him. He, uh, he's helped me grow as a leader. He's been fantastic. Uh, as far as what I do, if we're just talking to staff, first off with my guys is, you know, I want to, I want to add value besides just teaching them about how to, how to train the split squat, how to coach the belt squat, right? How to coach the a skip. So what I want to do is I've been impacted by a lot of other coaches and, uh, you know, I've, I've taken great notes. I was, I was a terrible student in college, but on the stuff I love and I'm passionate about, I'm, I'm pretty good at taking notes. I'm pretty good at learning these things. And, you know, uh, Chris Peterson has been a coach I worked with at Boise and learned a ton from him. And the funny thing is, is I, I still like to study him, right? I'm still listening to presentations. I'm still going back on my notes and, you know, I'll give handouts to our staff on the things that Chris Peterson taught me, right? And they impacted me. And I'm not saying that these guys are going to be impacted the exact same way, but these are principles of leadership. These are principles of being like a, a man of character, right? A man that is humble. And, you know, I'm trying to, to let them, you know, have these, these, uh, these examples that I went through, right? And I know it's not the same, but whether it's reading different books, I'm giving them notes, I'm just going over, we'll do uh, different workshops. And we did a What Drives Winning workshop with a staff. And of course, Chris Peterson did that with uh, Brett Ledbetter. And that was awesome. And the coolest thing was, is we, there, there's like Monday morning value to it. There's takeaways that we could use right now to get us better. And that's the biggest thing I want too is, is I'm always challenging them. Hey, I'm giving you this information, right? Um, it doesn't mean nothing if we go over it one time and we read it as a staff. What, what are you going to do to make you better? How are you going to use this to make you a better coach, a better person, right? Because it's all about the implementation. It doesn't matter that you read something. We went over it as a staff. 
how are you going to go apply that stuff now to be a better leader, to be a better coach? Yeah. Did you find that your staff was actually able to take that away rather than just avoid the group? Think of like, Oh yeah, I really like that. Or like, were you guys, are you pushing them to not only do yes, the group presentation learning, but also, Hey, let's, let's learn different things. And then you come present back so we can learn from hey, yeah. six of us. So it's like, is that what you're doing too? Yeah. So I'm actually really excited about this next project with the staff. Uh, I I've just been studying uh, the Chicago Cubs and Joe Madden, Theo Epstein, right? You read the, you read the Cubs way book. Yes. Right. Uh, and okay. uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I haven't read it all, oh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. Good. And I, I've put nine pages of notes together from Joe Madden, from Theo Epstein. And what I loved about Theo Epstein is character. It was all about character first. Right. And that, that's something I deeply believe in when I'm hiring a staff. First thing I want to know, are you a man of character? Are you high character? But it was really cool to see Theo really into that, how detailed he was with his scouting department, the standards he had. And then Joe, Joe Madden, like all like his coaching philosophy, his 13 principles, you know, about attitude is decision. It's about being positive. It's not about beating guys down. Um, all things we've heard before, but it's good to read it through uh, through a different lens. And then even Ken Revisa. So the handout I'm going to have is going to be Joe Madden stuff. It's going to be Theo Epstein. And then it's going to be some Ken Revisa stuff because he helped him and Joe Madden were really close. And obviously he's the mental performance guru. He's a legend, right? Rest in peace. Um, but that we're going to go over that. But then I'm going to challenge my staff. I want you guys to go study a coach. Go study a coach. Take some time really learn from somebody who impacted you or somebody you just want to learn more from get as much as you can come back and then give us a handout and then teach us. And I'm, if you can just take one little thing that makes you think differently about something or one little thing that's going to make you a better coach or a better person or better, whatever it is to me, it's worth it. And, and when I'm learning, when I'm growing, when I'm reading, when I'm having these talks with our staff, I'm getting better, right? Because too, I'm, I'm more sharp, right? I'm more confident when I'm not, when I'm not learning, when I'm not reading, uh, you know, I'm not as sharp. I'm not as confident. And, and that's just something that I've learned about myself that I always want to be learning. And, you know, I want, I want to try to help the staff with that too, right? And impact them as much as I can there. Have you gotten to the part in the book where Matt in, in his list of wines, if players made a mistake? His list of what? Wine. Like, did, like yes, when yeah, they instead right? of fines, right? Yeah. 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 So for you know, the the this baseball coach, he anytime like the players would make a mistake, rather than finding them and just like hitting their bank account and just like being like, hey, you made a mistake. It's he's got this list on his desk. He loves wine, and it's like, hey, you got to like pick a bottle from this list, <laughs> and we're gonna sit together and we're gonna drink this bottle of wine because like we've just got to. We've got to fix whatever the the disconnect is here. And I had told my wife, I was like, this is genius. Like, obviously I can't do this in college. She's like, you know, what if you made him play, you know, a video, like made him play Madden with you or something. And I'm like, that's not a bad idea. But the whole idea was like, how do you change behavior for the better? Like, okay, there's a disconnect. Let's fix the disconnect. And it's, yeah. he can still find them by getting an expensive bottle of wine. <laughs> Cause, yeah, so you, love- you, you, get, you get really good or you get really hammered or kind of both. So. <laughs> yeah. And then maybe that fixes the problem, right? Like Yeah, what in- problem? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, I love, I love that idea of studying the different coaches because, um, you know, I feel like far too often if everybody just reads the same book or visits the same person, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I really like that from Cubs weight or, you know, like the yeah. fact that you're doing that. And I think – I think it also speaks to your awareness because, you know, if you have some of your assistants like, oh, I don't want to step on, like, I don't want to tell Jeff that I disagree with him, but if this is a completely independent topic of an independent mm-hmm. coach, they can have the ability to speak freely on, on whatever they want. Um, yeah. what, what I found fascinating in terms of learning recently was actually going like somewhere else just to read about and learn from people that have failed miserably or or maybe even like, try to learn from people I really don't like. <laughs> like, you know, you yeah. see coaches with, with internet, it's kind of easy and, and be like, hey, so, you know, we all sort of define our metrics for success. You know, what, what is success 
you know, for us, what, what, what does it mean to be successful? And, you know, some people, they can either be competition or not, you know, the markets get redrawn every day. But if I go and see something, my first reaction is like, Ugh. then maybe I'm like, wait, you know, cause, cause we know we're just like a cog in the engine. So the, the physical preparation and the culture and how much we can drive or balance or, or create some weight in, in an organization or in a group may vary between organizations. So the way I see coaches is, I think we talked about this in the last podcast is, you know, like players have ratings in, in, in sports games and, and video games. So they can have a 90, but a 90 can be made from speed power and be really bad defense and whatnot. So coaches get jobs for a reason. And you can't always go and say, you know, it's all about knowledge and being, you know, honest all the time. doesn't mean it's not valuable, but jobs and peoples are like markets. So I can't really say, oh, he's not good at his job or he's not talking the truth or who am I to say that, you know? So it's mm -hmm. about understanding what you believe you don't understand or what you reject naturally. So I think that's interesting. Just questioning myself. Yeah. That's good. Stuff. Yeah. And, and Boyle says it too, though, like, or other people say like, you can't, you can't, like everything you read or you can't read everything you like like you truly have to you, you know try to find it so it's not only just uh confirmation bias what stuff are you doing with your guys within the leadership so you say you're doing the record ring publish is any of those results from a physical um training is that going into you know your uh you know the the off-season team leadership challenges you got going on or what are you guys doing down there with that yeah, uh, so we're doing, we, we call it the Red Wolf Olympics, similar to what you guys did at Iowa, right? You got different teams, you got different leaders, yep. uh, you're just competing on everything from personal conduct to academics to performance. And that, that's been really good. It's been great for our guys. We're also doing a team book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. That's a we have, book. Each, yeah, that's great book, book, right? We have each team present from that book so we got uh 10 presentations where they present to the team and then they open some dialogue with the guys which has been impactful so far you know we had the program here uh from you know uh, eric capitulic and jake mcdonald fortunate enough to have them come down here and teach us some you know how to be a better teammate right how to be a better leader uh that was awesome that 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 made me a lot better i love that uh you, you know uh, and no keep going sorry well, and then, you know, for me, uh, and, and I kind of, you know, I, I learned this from a lot of coaches, but if all it is, is just lifting weights, right? If all I do is just get somebody faster and stronger, I failed at my job. And that's actually paraphrased from Ed Thomas, who's a legendary football coach from Athlington Parksburg. He said, if all I've done is to teach athletes how to block and tackle, I failed as a coach. How close, and, do you, how close to where he you know because i know hey, Ed's, uh, were you close my to his senior year uh we actually got our butts whooped by athlete parksburg <laughs> and he was the coach so we're about book, 45 yeah, away that from book him. is that's a that's another powerful book especially if you've ever yeah. lived in you know like yeah very powerful uh i've always even I, I remember being a high school kid and just looking up to him and knowing about his presence, his, his coaching style, the impact he's had on that whole community and all these players, you know, such a small town that has produced four NFL players. Uh, yeah, he, he is very special. And, and it's cool to see his son, Aaron, uh, you know, doing a lot of leadership talks and doing stuff like that now that I, I love listening to him and following him as well. Uh, do you have a hard time? And so my, my question is going to be, do you have a hard time fitting in the leadership stuff, like with those books, you know, within the, the hours, you know, the time constraints that we have, like it is difficult, but it, it is that important. Um, and my, my assistant, um, he made us realize like, Hey, we got to talk more about nutrition. Let's bring the nutritionist in because nutrition right now, um, imagine if weightlifting in practice was optional, right? How good are they going to get at it? We all know the yep. answer to that. And that's kind of how nutrition can be. If you just have a nutritionist on staff and it's like, Oh, go talk to her when you want, well, you're effectively making it optional. But for us, rather than, you know, if we're going to put extra mobility work at the end of training sessions, like, Hey, let's scrap that one of the days and let's bring her in. And it's forced talking about nutrition. Have you had, um, you know, what are some of the ways you're navigating, you know, making sure you guys are talking about it? Yeah. So what I do is, is going back to Ed Thomas quote, right? So for me, if all I've done is get people faster and stronger and more resilient, 
I, I've failed them as a coach. I believe that because there's so much more that goes into it from your mindset, from who you are as a person. And I believe this, and this is from the All Blacks, and this is, you know, Theo Epstein talks about as well in the Cubs way is better people make better All Blacks. This is what, what drives winning is about too. You develop the person, you focus on the person, you develop the habits of being a person of character. That's going to make you a better player. So I'm, I'm so far gone on that thought. I believe in that deeply. So what I want to do is, I, I call it these uh, micro daily and weekly coaching sessions. Not long, right? And I have this little, uh, where is it? I got just this basic piece of paper right here, right? I just fold it up. I write down the day. I write down the message at the beginning that I'm going to give the team. I write down my message at the bottom. I have this 90 page document from all the notes, all the things I've learned. And I'm always adding to it that are things that I just put in there that I think athletes would benefit from hearing from, right? Whether it's a character thing, it's a mindset thing, it's a high performing thing. And I'm always going through that. And then I'll write down the message. And what I've done is usually my message at the beginning, not long, just about something we got to do today, getting your mind right, getting ready to focus, getting ready to attack this workout, right? I'll let them know what we got for speed, this and that. I want to keep it very short, right? Because I, I can tell their minds right. They're getting ready. And then at the end of the lift, I'll always break them down. And then I'll get more in depth. And I don't want to talk for five minutes. I, five, that's way too long, right? I want to talk for maybe at the most two to three minutes. But it, it's something that, that's going to impact them as a man, as a performer, as a competitor, whatever it is. A lot of times it's nutrition. Sometimes it's habits. Sometimes it's about being a better leader. Sometimes it's about being a better man. Sometimes it's about self-awareness, right? Whatever it is. And uh, I've, that, that's something I didn't do at App State, right? And I regret that. And I was going to make damn sure that wasn't going to happen again. And, and the biggest compliment I can receive from an athlete is, hey, yeah, sure, you got faster, stronger, whatever. But coach, I really appreciate you making me understand the importance of being more detailed. Coach, I really appreciate you making me understand that you know, character is, is a skill I can develop, right? These are skills that I can work on. I can be a better person. I can do this. And it, it's those types of things that when they leave here, they're going to remember these times, right? They're going to remember the skills, the things they learned from the weight room, from practice, from training, that is going to make them a more effective leader, make them more effective husband, dad, wh whatever it is. I mean, you can, you can clearly see it's just kind of coming out from you and, that, that post-training talk is actually something that I started to do again um, here at Towson because at Iowa, yeah, we didn't do it, right? We, you know, when guys were done training, they'd get their shake, they'd leave. But kind of like you said, I found I found the value in not only just giving that quick, you know, hey, breakdown of how, how the day went, talk to them about something leadership-wise or, um, you know, mindset-wise. And then the third mm -hmm. thing will always be like, hey, this is what's coming up for tomorrow. Even if it's something as simple as yesterday when we were done with the lift, it was, hey, guys, way to, you know, re-attack yep. what we were doing. We got back. But, hey, all right, reminder, tomorrow is practice. This is the times. And just continuing to, to help them with that. So that's that's something that um, I agree. I, I, when I looked back, I was like, that's something that I need to start reintegrating re to. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, you know, looking at the time here, I, I, I appreciate the time for, you know, you – talking with us um where where where's somewhere on twitter and instagram that you know people can reach out and follow because like i said you set the you set social media on fire by not back squatting and you know not power cleaning and doing all the starfish catches um where can people follow you and just see the, the good work that you guys are putting out there hey, i want to share something on cleaning real quick okay i, I want to see if this makes sense to anybody so uh we don't clean right uh, we've seen, we, we have two guys that jump 40 for one 45, seven, one 45, eight. We've had guys go from 34 to 43, right? I had a guy actually go 34 to 43. I don't believe, right? it. I don't believe it. Just, I don't know. That doesn't make sense. You can't, <laughs> anyway, can't that, happen. We see some crazy results, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, do you guys understand how to jump better on the jump mat for sure? But like there's been some good improvements yeah. and, uh, you know, we don't clean, uh, here, we, we replace cleans with weighted jumps and we have, we have over 16 different jump metrics. And what we do is we have a, a 50 pound jump, a 40 pound jump, 30, 
a 20 pound jump, a 10 pound jump, dumbbells in each hand. Right. Yep. And then, uh, we have a one step jump, a one step, 10 pound jump. We have a depth drop jump. We have a normal vertical jump. We have a trap bar jump, a 95 pound jump. And what we do is we have a non counter movement, 30 pound jump. We have a non counter movement, body weight jump. And we, we just get personal records. And th this is, to me, this is from Louis Simmons, right? Another one, rest in peace with him. Uh, yeah. He was always about breaking records there, right? Oh, he, so, had a, he had a different record for every day. It was like, let's do it, you know. Yeah. And a, a feet uh, so elevated I, good morning record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I kind of stole that from him where, like, like let's break, rec we have a personal record belt too. So let's, uh, let's try to get guys to break records from a 50 pound jump we'll revisit it in seven to eight weeks and it was kind of cool yesterday we revisited our 30 pound jump from week two of off season and every single guy in our defense pr except one and from week two so it's just it's been in some pr by like five inches six inches right and, and that that was really cool to see but guys have gotten really explosive so the weighted jumps have really taken a big part of our power development. But another thing we do, so if you want, you want to break down the clean, right? If we just want to look at the clean, the movement itself. Um, first off, I know at Iowa, you guys really liked it because of the overload of the hip girdle, right? That's what we told everybody else. <laughs> okay. Hey, this is what we do though. So I think overloading the hip girdle is fine. So what we do is a power complex where we usually do three to four exercises all paired together. Power complex, first movement, barbell RDL. We're overloading the hip girdle, right? We go inch or two below the knee because once the hips stop moving, we want the movement to be done. We don't want them to move at their low back, but they'll go a little bit, just an inch or two below the knee, and then they come up, squeeze their glutes, stand up tall. We'll do five reps of that. And usually this is just three sets of this. We'll do five sets of an RDL and guys will get to 315, 365, 405. After RDL, we'll go do a weighted jump. That's a metric that we're tracking. So we're trying to get as high as we can. So now we overload the hip girdle, right? We got extension of the knee and hip where the guy's squeezing his glutes. Obviously we didn't get up on the toes there, but then we're gonna go over and do a true full triple extension movement with weights. And we know if we look at the force plate data, weighted jumps, you're producing a ton of force. So we did our RDL, we did our weighted jumps. The guys are competing, they're getting after it. After the weighted jump, we have two options. We could, well, actually we have three options. We could do a repeat hurdle jump. If you wanna work more of the spring work, we could do a band resisted trap bar jump because we know about the force on band resisted jumps, right? Or trap bars when the weight is pulling you down, right? And we'll do usually five to eight reps of that or the hurdle jumps, or we'll do a depth drop stick. And the reason we do a depth drop stick or altitude drop yep. is because why? For the catch of the clean. Everybody wants to talk about the catch of the clean, right? Handling forces, eccentric force. Well, if you look at the data, I'm pretty sure the data and the research shows us an altitude drop, the forces there are a little bit higher than maybe a 295-pound starfish clean. You, uh, How high are you going to start with those boxes? Do you do it based off of their vertical jump height or do you just kind of... Nope. They, not based off vertical jump height just their ability to stick if they yeah. can stick it without any give or being squishy right yeah. they're good you know um so there we're working our brakes and then we'll do like some type of three-dimensional uh plyo whether it's the vector jump or like a single leg icky or something more for the foot and ankle that's three-dimensional and we call that a power complex so to me like you look at the six to eight minutes we invest in that power complex, three sets of all that, you look at the accumulative forces of all the forces you're producing with your RDL, right? Stand up for it, do your RDL, do your way to jump, do your band resistant trap bar jump. And then all those forces, I'll take all those forces you're applying and accumulating compared to five sets of two hang clean and those forces that you get just with that, that's gonna maybe even take more than eight minutes. No, oh, 100%. And so like that's, you know, that, 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 that's my thoughts on that. And, and I tell you, I'm really big into precision and I really wanna see guys do things well. And when guys don't do things well, that, that is hard for me to deal with, right? So not a lot of guys clean well, <laughs> it's what it is. <laughs> we all know that, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you look at the, the guys that have lost NFL careers through wrist surgery, wrist injuries, low back injuries, whatever it is, like why, why would, 
I, I just, I don't want to mess with that. Right. And, and, and we, we get guys pretty darn explosive and strong here without doing that. Yeah. I mean, I'd say 40, you know, 45 on the jump mat is, uh, you know, if only it was, if only you guys were doing more cleans, it could be some 47s hey, and 48s. You know what's funny though? Because no, <laughs> DeMarco, right? He, he has similar success with that stuff. Yeah. And uh, he, he had a guy at 44, 45. And I'm like, we had a guy come in at 40 and I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know how much more we can go from there. Both of these guys, one came in at 40 and one came in at 41. Right. And I'm like, man, I, I don't know, maybe we can get 42 out of these guys, maybe. And then you'd be surprised with all the different weighted jumps with making every rep meaningful, important with the heavy single leg work, the heavy belt squats, all that stuff. I think it's all together. And then, and then too, it's, it's the, the coaching, right? If, if they were casual with their reps, if they didn't attack their training, if they were just on autopilot, right? You're not going to see those results. So I think it's everything. It's not just the exercise. It's not just the workout. It's the system. It's the coaching. It's all that combined. That is pretty fun. You can see some pretty freaky stuff. Yeah. And like you said too, about, you know, you mentioned Louie, but like, you know, you're, you're, you're putting, I mean, when you bring a 40 inch guy into the room, now you got guys like shit, like I got to, I got to really turn it on. And I saw that happen for us. Like we got a, we got a kid that transferred from, um, a transfer wide receiver, he comes in the room and he's already the best vertical jumper. And now he's like, well, shit, now I got to try even harder on it. So again, yeah. going, going back to it's a instantaneous record rank published, but now it's, Hey, he's pushing the envelope and then, okay, well now he doesn't want to not be the best jumper. And now he went from 40 to 44. And, you know, like you said, you combine that with intentful training, you intent, you combine that with, you know, good coaches and proper nutrition, like, yeah. Kudos and then the thing is, everybody sees those numbers too. You sent them to the coaches too, you said? Yeah, they're out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and it, it exposes guys. If you're a pretender, if you're casual, if you don't want to attack, if you're, if you're not relentless, you're going to have a hard time in this system because you're not ringing the bell. You're getting exposed because you're not progressing at a rate where most of the other team is. And, and that, that, that's been eye-opening too. And, and it's helped us with conversations with guys because believe me, that's not, that's not every single guy doing that, you know? So if you cleaned more, it would be every single guy. So yes. probably if you could, Possibly. Figure, if you could fix that, you know, this probably be better. <laughs> yeah. No, um, Jeff, like I can't, uh, I can't say thank you enough for this. This has been educational for me. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm thoroughly enjoyed catching up to you. I feel, feel like I got to stay in touch with you even more now because of the, uh, just the, yeah. the knowledge bombs. Like you said, I feel the same way. If I'm not learning, I feel like I'm not sharpening myself either. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Same here. So I appreciate your time. And uh, let's not forget to um, leave people a place where they can find you and get more of these uh, knowledge bombs, get educated. Yeah. Okay. So I think my Twitter is Jones. Why <laughs> Jeff? I don't know if there's a one on there or not. I think that's it. what I'm not. Yeah. It. I'm not, you know, <laughs> and I probably should tweet a little bit more. I haven't done that in a while, but maybe I, I should get back to that. Huh, Lima? Like I said, you, I mean, Twitter was on fire when you were at App State because it was, these guys just, I mean, you were blowing people out of the water winning the, I think you guys went 10 and one and, you know, like it was, everything was belt squatting and jumping high, but there was no cleans and there was no back squats, but yeah. And believe me at, by the time we we're in the summer and in season, I believe they were bought in. Right. But believe me, January, was a battle yeah. <laughs> and that just you know, there were battles every day and, and and it was a challenge but i believed in it and it took time but guys saw the improvements they they felt better they felt faster more explosive like we you know and it, and it takes time right you do something right away you know it's be patient and i know that's hard should, for all of us yeah you should get john to you know john get john to up your uh your Twitter Twitter game status so that way he can you know I know he's always posting stuff when he's out in the mountains tell him to get some stuff and you guys jumping high and lifting stuff fast oh yeah yep all right brother well, I appreciate it thank you very much Jeff thank, Take you, care. thank you yep you guys have a good one yeah you too yeah bye
Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.